invited to come along and talk about um, integrating Māori and Indigenous approaches to, uh, to governance. Um, and, and as I was listening to the two previous speakers, I couldn't help but thinking that Māori people and Indigenous communities have been doing this. Mm. And I don't mean any disrespect at all. Um, but you know, I, just, I just had this more than an unnerving feeling that many of the answers have been there and many of the solutions to, to many of the big problems that are confronting not only this country but you know, the planet if you want to, you want to go rip large across the globe um, in, 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 in the environmental space and the future of our not only of our natural resources but you know our our survival, you know, and um, so so when I when I when I listened to you, I thought, well, the indigenous people, Maori people, have had to be highly adaptive, highly participatory, um, to a, a whole range of different contexts um, during the colonial period. You know, in those contexts, you know, they're all in a place and in a space. Um, but they're also varied from violent to, um, you know, on the one hand, dismissive on the other. And then increasingly, I think, in countries like New Zealand, um, increasingly conciliatory. But, you know, what if the, the contexts have, have, have changed through time. And um, we are where we are today in this country. Um, and it hasn't been any accident. Uh, it's been on the back of a huge amount of work and political protest by Māori, uh, by, by Ibi. Anyway, look, I don't, I don't want to turn this into a political speech because that's what's been Peter's job. Um, and I know I've only got 20 minutes. So look, I've, got, I've got a presentation that I want to get through. But the question that I really do want to put to you first off is when we talk about integrating, what are we talking about? Are we talking about integrating to who's? Whose system? You know, which direction all the arrows going? You know, on what terms? You know, who owns? Who owns the resource? Um, does anyone own it? And you know, when we talk about governance, what does good governance mean? You know, um, as all of us know, these are highly contextualised, they're culturally constructed, they're socially constructed, they're even economically constructed, and certainly politically constructed. So I think there are some really fundamental questions um, that we do need to ask ourselves. And, and it's around the issue of what does good mean? What does good governance mean? Um, and I'm not even off my first slide. But anyway, <laughs> uh, what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd start, this is a, um, the front cover of a, um, an iwi management plan, iwi resource management plan. Um, or Tetomu Duruna, and it's one of the uh, hapu that I pop up to on my Ngaitahu side. Um, and I chaired the committee that prepared this probably about 10 years ago. And if you want a really good adaptive slash anticipatory governance document, go to that one. Um, and I suppose all I'm saying is many UE management plans, hapu management plans uh, throughout the country are highly anticipatory are highly adaptive because they've had to be. Okay, and they've had to be in a place and with a resource or their lake or their river, you know, whether it's way up there or whether it's way up there. Okay, anyway, so we to move on. Okay, so anyway, first things first. Um, Maori environmental governance and management has always existed. So, so sometimes you need to say this right up front. It, it has always existed. Um, and the nature of this governance is not a disinterested, disconnected, dispassionate <coughs> association or form of governance. It's highly connected um, and, it, and it stretches back through time. So, so some of the previous speakers spoke about you know, anticipatory governance and, and the importance of the long term view. And, you know, certainly Maori communities have had to take this kind of long term view um, because that long term view requires that we 
not only um, acknowledge the past, um, but that we acknowledge our association with our ancestors, our tikkuna, our resources, our lands, our places, and the memories those carry with them. You know, so it's, it's a very passionate, very human engagement, and it isn't just about this kind of disconnected association with the environment. So the, the, this connection is both, you know, it's certainly temporal, it's clearly spatial, um, but that connection is both cultural, social, and economic, and everything else that goes with it. So there's a much broader context within which this fits. So it's multi-layered, multi-faceted, multi-dimensional. Um, and I think if we're looking at this within the context of Aotearoa, um, what we've known, you know, as Māori, as good governance, is called te rangatirata and kaitakita. Okay, so on the one hand, it's one, it's one thing to have authority or dominion over, and I don't think rangatirata is that, but it, but it connotes an authority or um, a, um, a man. But you can't have run the tiritanga in a vacuum either. You know, it brings with really strong obligations. So it's a strong ethical responsibility. And, and Kei Te Aki Tanga, is, you know, as many of you all know, is a, a wonderful word that actually captures it. So it's concepts. Run the tiritanga and Kei Te Aki Tanga have been the Maori approach to environmental governance and certain management. So you, you take those two terms together and what we, are, what we are creating is the clear responsibility um, incumbent on mana penua, whether it's Yatiawa, Ngatikoro, Maitahu, um, Ngapuhi, to govern and manage their environment and natural resources wisely. Okay, so the notion of wise stewardship clearly is, 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 is well and truly here. As we all know, affirmed by the Treaty of Waitangi, so it's not my job to give you a treaty lecture, you all know about it. Um, Certainly, this was affirmed, it wasn't given by the Treaty of White it was already there, so it was actually affirmed. But the context that we're in today is highly contested. We, we, we're currently living in a highly contested uh, ownership regime, and we have been since 1840. So, to be able to do that, you've had to be able to be adapted. Governments come, governments go. You've had to be highly anticipatory. What is next year going to look like, let alone 10, 15, 20 years out? And as many of us know, there is still a high degree of contest between um, over, you know, ownership contest over water, coastal foreshore, and seabed, and we don't know what the next resource is going to be. Okay, so this is an ongoing menu. Um, territorial local authorities, regional councils, what they weren't doing. Okay, and I think the view was, well, hold on a minute, you've had many, many years to deal with this, and yet, the Manuka Harbour is still the toilet of all things. You know, there was clear demarcation between the Clean Harbour, and it was the Waikamata Harbour, you know, the pristine Waikamata Harbour, and then there was, that, it was even spoken about it in those days when I was working with the, the regional council. So there was, there was this idea um, that you know, the Monica Harbour was where all the pollution went, the industrial runoff, sewerage, everything else, but there was a clean harbour. Well, at the start of the Benua, in that context, you know, you are going to be highly adapted, highly politicised to what you need to do. I don't mean to sound angry if I am. It's totally unintentional. Um, but the other thing is this is also happening around the country. The Mutanui Waitara uh, claim um, further north from here, uh, the Kaituna River claim and the Lotus River, and yeah, they're all saying very similar things. What they're also saying was resource management law had failed us. You know, resource management law had failed us. So in a way what it did is it catapulted the Resource Management Law Reform, and clearly we we, we, uh, we got the Resource Management Act. Okay, so many of these claims to the Waitrang Tribunal uh, during the mid-80s. Um, now, I remember talking to Ngāniko at the time that we were, they were, but I was assisting them, 
the preparation probably of the, the second heavy management that they did in this country. And when it was being prepared, I remember Nanako and many of the elders were being very reluctant about using the word ownership. They were very reluctant to use the word ownership when it uh, was referring to the natural environment. What they realised though was that by only using the word keitakitanga, it was perceived to be weakened. So even in this document here, if you go through, um, what, what we had to do is, on the recommendation of the tribe, wherever keitaki was used, um, we had to slash it with ownership as well. So through this document, there are references to Kaitiaki slash ownership. Um, and, and really the key reason for that was the tribe was aware that unless they included ownership in there, um, they would not be able to exercise their Kaitiaki kind of responsibilities. Okay, they, they needed the, the grunt and the ammunition to be able to be Kaitiaki, with the result that um, uh, ownership is, is scattered through this document, even though they didn't like it. So it wasn't about ownership of the resources. <coughs> it was a platform to be able to exercise Kaitiaki mm -hmm. Right. Okay, fast forward a few more years, and uh, we had the Coastal Foreshore Seabed um, issue in 2004. Um, I mean, I won't necessarily go through this, but many of you would have been familiar with what was happening in this country at the time. And, um, I mean, there are some really interesting quotes. Uh, for example, Hapi Hai Te Kawa, Ngāti Whātua Chief in 1879, said, although land may have been sold, we never sold the sea or the fish in it. Okay, we never sold the sea or the fish in it. So how do you create governance arrangements when you've got this knowledge? And, um, and in a way, Māori have retained, well not in a way, um, Māori have retained mana over foreshore and seabed, for instance, um, since, you know, since prior to the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Okay, so that's a, Māori, that's a space that Māori inhabit. Okay? Uh, we never gave away our mana, we never gave away ownership. Um, and as we all know, in 2004, we had the Foreshore Seabed Act, uh, where I suppose what I'm doing here is I'm illustrating ha, ha, how do you govern when there are flip-flops around ownership? Mm. You know, I mean, you've really got to be very astute, and as I said, highly adapted to change uh, that is surely going to come, but you're not quite sure where it's going to come from. Okay, well, in this case, we know that it created the Māori Party. Um, but it's kind of flip flopping around ownership. Now, as we also know, um, in a way, thanks to the Māori Party, I assume, that the, the notion of um, crown ownership of Portugal Seabed was, was, was turned around, and we now have a no ownership regime. So it's now gone back into you know, the no ownership kind of category. Um, so I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, we've got to be able to anticipate. Um, how we still care for the resource, how we still care for the environment, the things that are important to us in a, in a highly changing uh, situation. Now, the interesting thing about the coastal foreshore seabed um, uh, debate as well is that ownership is also seen as critical to not only exercising customary rights, um, but also contemporary opportunities. And I think there's always been this concern that Māori, Māori development has tended to be kind of compartmentalised to the past and been customary. You know, so, so I think even that creates a whole lot of challenges um, for how, how, we, how we distribute and how we carry out good governance. And it's not necessarily locking Māori what it isn't. Locking Māori into a kind of museum who's um, kind of configuration. Okay, so the coastal foreshore seabed um, debate clearly put this way back on the national agenda. Okay, fast forward again to 2010 um, and even as well recently as this year, we now have a situation where the law 
in this country is finally starting to catch up. Okay, so it's taken a long time to get here. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because um, many here we have been saying this for, for, for years. You know, it's, it's, this is not new, although it might appear radical and, and quite revolutionary. Um, the Waikato River Settlement Act in 2010, um, the Waikato River is, is defined as a treaty, it's actually in law, and uh, Waikato have always known that, but it's now in law. So the Waikato River is a tupuna, it has its own mana, um, it represents the mana and the modi or the life force of the tribe, and there's also a, a, a kind of governance arrangement to, to manage that. I guess, but what we're seeing is the incorporation of different notions of how we associate with, with our environment. Not for Māori, but for, for this country. You know, the Waikato River is a tūpuna, it has its own mana. Um, fast forward to 2014 and the Te Uriwera Act. Um, the Te Uriwera, as many of us know, um, is a legal person. Also, in, in the law, um, Te Uriwera is a legal entity. It has all the rights, powers, duties and responsibilities of a legal person. And there is a governance arrangement that has been included in the um, Tuatha Wet Act 2014. This year, as many of us also know, um, the, the Te Awa Tupu Whamanui River Act came into, um, came into being. And um, it's really interesting reading through that act, and I, I've just been catching up like everyone with a lot of this. Uh, but when I was reading through the, um, the act last night, uh, Te Awa Tupua is an indivis indivisible living whole. It has the rights, <coughs> powers, and duties of a legal person. And an entity called Te Awa Tupua has been created, um, one member of the iwi, one, one member of the crown, to speak on behalf of the river. Okay, so what, what this is saying, is the river is its own entity, is its own person, is its own mana, has its own mode. So whatever governance arrangements we end up with, they have to be able to reflect that. Mm -hmm. I suppose all I'm saying is the law in this country, I think, is finally caught up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's there yet, uh, because one could challenge the the, the representative arrangements, but you know, I'm not going to do that today. Um, really all I'm saying is, you know, this country has caught up with what Māori and Iwi have been saying for, you know, my own, for, for generations. Ooh, gosh, four minutes, right? Okay, um, so, so this notion of a natural resource, all natural resources, harbours, rivers, lakes, coast, water, and seabed, uh, Taonga, they're highly valued entities, they're, they're tūpuna, they're ancestors, with their own mana or prestige and modi or force. So the role of Māori environmental governance is to protect, maintain and enhance the modi and the mana of our taonga. Okay, so for me, this is at the heart of what it means to do good Māori environmental governance. I won't, I won't, I've, I've been working on a framework for, for many years uh, during my work with Iwi and um, it's what I've, I've called the, the Modi Order Systems Framework. So, so one of the things I've been challenging myself with is how do you take that and how do you put it into some kind of decision making framework? Okay, if it's one thing to think this, we then have to, okay, how do we work with it? Um, so I've been work, working with this for many years, and it's a, it's a framework that I've used with, with many iwi. Um, it's nothing flash, to be honest, um, but what it's doing is it's capturing the key elements um, that, that I've been talking about. And it just looks like this. Okay. What has to drive good environmental governance is protecting the modi, protecting the modi and the mana of our resources. Now whether that resource is a river, the Waiaku, 
a harbour such as the Monaco Harbour. If we, if we can't create governance arrangements that drive to that, we have a big problem. Now, I know Māori communities are actually doing that in their own way. What is the issue? Who are the kaitiaki? What are their taonga? What tikanga or values do they use to apply to that? What practices do they want to put in place to protect that, the modi of that resource? How do they take that, turn it into a decision, and then a strategy? Okay, so we need to get uh, uniquely Māori and Indigenous concepts. We need to put them into a decision-making planning framework. Now, I know I've got a minute. Um, I've just said that, um, and that, that's really all that's saying. What is the take? Who are the kaitiaki? What tonga is going to be potentially affected? What tikanga? Etc. Etc. So I, I, I'm, I'm just positing that um, once again as a framework that we can look at. This notion of kaitiaki as governance. You know, for me, a good Maori environmental governance system will do this. It will restore damage to ecological systems, restore ecological harmony, ensure resources and their usefulness increases, reduce risk to present and future generations, and provide for the needs of present and future generations. Those are my words. Those are the words of this document that was created over 25 years ago. Okay? It's been around for a long time. The challenge is for us to actually activate it. And. In terms of um, tikanga for environmental governance, um, these are some key tikanga Māori that you can apply um, to this notion of what does good environmental governance mean. Whether it's adaptive, anticipatory, you know, whatever. Well, we got through that. Um, so, look, I just want to leave this with you today, folks. Um, I think that my concluding comment is this, <coughs> that good governance has to be unambiguously focused and clearly focused on not only retaining the, the, the motive, but protecting and enhancing it. So we've got to have something that we drive to. We can put a lot of things around it, but good environmental governance of any kind must drive to that as its common aim and common goal and a unifying thing for us.